as we're all stuck at home with nothing better to do and um, all we really can do is get prepared for when we can open again um, I think this is something that absolutely every restaurant operator could get involved in so I'm going to take you through step by step the sort of um, what we at Two Forks call the 360 menu optimization process so this is exactly the steps that I would go through with our clients on a big on a big project and I'm going to try and break it into simple steps with advice on how you can do it yourself so I'll just get uh, stuck in oh I can't there we go. So who the fork? Um, the two forks is me and Anna. We are food and drink copywriters. I did an intro in the other masterclass we did the other day, so I'm not going to go too far into what we do. Just to highlight that um, menu development and menu optimization is our absolute sweet spot. It's what we love to do. We work with the likes of Oaxaca, Dishoom, Rosas Thai, uh, and we've been able to achieve some really amazing results for everyone. So just thought I'd share a little picture of Tommy looking happy with her new menu there. Very good. So moving into the step by step. Um, step one, set some goals. So um, a lot of the time, menu optimization will be profit driven. So um, who doesn't want to make a bit more money, right? And I think as we reopen after the lockdown, that's going to be very important to a lot of people. But you can also use your um, menu as a tool for uh, driving other um, goals within your business. So perhaps you want to do a bit more storytelling, getting that brand story across and getting people to sort of find themselves um, closer to your brand. Um, you can also improve the user experience of your menu, help people have a better time in your restaurants. That was actually the number one goal for the Oaxaca project was they discovered that people who ate in a certain, or who ordered in a certain way were a lot happier than the people who um, tried to order a sort of three course standard oh, okay. domain dessert. Um, so when we analyzed online reviews for them, it was very clear that the people who were sharing foods um, and eating from the small plates left much better reviews than the people who sort of approached it in the more traditional sort of European sense. So a lot of um, what went into that project was sort of steering people towards a different way of ordering. So user ex experience is really important and also aesthetics. Sometimes menus just don't look very good. Um, so a bit of um, strategic development can help with, with the looks of it as well. Um, step two, which is always our step one in, in, in any sort of process after goal um, setting is talk to your customers. This is exactly the same slide that I had in the tone of voice development talk last week. Um, it's just so important to find out what your market is looking for. So um, phone interviews are, are really great. With menus, we love holding focus groups because you can actually set up a sort of role play scenario where you can um, interact with people. Um, we like to set people up in um, a sort of dining room layout. So you've got couples sitting at tables with menus pretending to order so we can dig into how they're ordering, why they order a certain way. Um, but you could also run surveys, ask people what they think about your menu, what stands out, what they don't like, what they feel is missing. Um, you can also glean a lot from online reviews. So if you look at any kind of comments about the range of food on offer, their um, problems where um, expectations are different from reality, so where people were expecting something and then they weren't happy with the result, a lot of that comes down to, to the language on the menu that something is described in a way that people don't expect. So really dig into the insights from your customers because they will guide you towards um, improving your menu so that it works for them. Step, th um, step three, oh actually no, I've got a break slide in here. Um, while um, you've got people in a room, so at a focus group, you can't really run that right now, but you could run it possibly over Zoom if you post people the menu or share it via PDF. Um, get people to actually make scribbles on the menu. So we usually instruct people to sit down, think about um, looking at the menu as if they were about to order something and then just sort of circle and star things that really pop out to them, cross over things that they don't really like and make notes as they go so that they can sort of um, talk back to you with those um, notes as you uh, catch up 
after after the sort of ordering process and you can get some really cool insights from people just to look at the way that they've scribbled on the menu yeah. so being quite visual is uh, is fun there um, step three is talk to your teams so whenever we do a big menu development project we will always um, interview both the back of house teams and the front of house teams at the restaurant so the back of house teams you you're talking at looking at um, you're looking at talking at the uh, you're looking at talking to the chefs about what dishes trip them up mm -hmm. like I just got tripped up so which ones are a pain to prepare um, are there any um, things on the menu that go particularly well when they're ordered at the same time can we make maybe make their life easier by encouraging people to order in a certain way because happy teams make for happy customers so um, if you can sort of use the opportunity to oil the machine even back of house that's always a good opportunity are clients open to you doing that or do they give you some resistance Nobody's ever said no. We, we're quite dictatorial though. We'll go in and say, this is our process. These are the steps we're going to do. Um, and I guess maybe we scare them and they, <laughs> they don't say no, but we've never had any protests. So, um, yeah. you know, and, and we also, we don't talk to every single one, but so for a restaurant group, we will talk to, you know, the head chef or the sous chef at each site just to find out um, a bit of feedback from the teams. Um, at front of house, we try to um, talk to one sort of normal um, waiter and one manager level uh, front of house, house staff just to get their feedback. So when you talk to the front of house, we we're looking to find those sort of wow dishes, you know, the things that kind of surprise people. So um, when they bring the food to the table, people get a really pleasant reaction for the, from them. That's usually an indication that it's... Um, the menu wasn't quite doing its job. So if they're pleasantly surprised to see something, perhaps it could be described better on the menu so that you draw more people to those. We also interview the front of house teams to find out what are the dishes that people most complain about. That usually also ties back to how they're described on the menu and not meeting expectations. Um, we have a long list of sort of 20 questions that we run through with the teams to find out like everything we can about how people order, how many questions they get about things, which other dishes people ask about the most, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, speak to your teams. They have a lot of insights into what works and what doesn't work with the menu because they have to live through it every day. And quite often the teams are so relieved that someone is asking them, you know? So that's always good. Uh, step four is organize your sales data. So, um, now that every restaurant has some kind of EPOS system, it's so easy to look at um, your sales data. And this is not just to look at what's driving the most profit, but it can actually give you lots of insights into consumer behavior and the way that people order. So um, decide whether you're gonna um, look at your data for a week, for a month, for a quarter or a year. We usually recommend looking at three months worth of data. And then we put it all into a spreadsheet. So we look at the number of items sold for each item. We look at the profit for each individual one um, and, the, and the price for each individual one. And we like to focus on um, actual cash in the till, not percentage of GP. So when we're looking at an individual dish, we look at what is the cash contribution per sale of that item. Uh, every time you sell it, this is how much cash you end up uh, with instead of comparing percentages because they can be so different between item to item. So just to um, to get a clear view in your head about which dishes are actually making you the most money, not the most percentage profit. Um, so what we do once we've um, got all of that data from EPOS, we categorize each an, um, item into one of four categories. So we've got the, the items that are the winners are the um, really popular dishes. So they sell in high volume, uh, but they also make you a big cash contribution per sale. We've got the crowd pleasers that are also really popular, but they don't make you so much money every time you sell it. We've then got the potentials, which are the dishes that aren't selling a lot but when you do sell them they make you a lot of money so that's obviously an area that you'd want to push in some way and then you've got the losers that you don't really sell very many of and they don't make you much money when you do sell them and surprisingly a lot of menus have a lot of losers on them and they're pretty much just dead weight that should um, 
get dropped. So um, good to identify those. Um, what we do with this is we um, get our highlighters out and we actually highlight the menu in various colors. I've actually run low on my highlighters, so I, I wasn't able to um, get the colors as distinct from each other as possible. But also I can't share actual menus from projects that we worked on because it's all sensitive <laughs> information, I guess, which ones sell the most and which ones don't. Um, so this is just a menu that I have in my menu file that I've um, completely made up some highlights on. So Bedford and Strand isn't necessarily selling more chicken liver pate than anything else, but just for, um, for argument's sake, I've highlighted here. So I would use a different highlighter for um, the winners. So, so, so hypothetically, this could be a winning dish for them. They sell a lot of it and they make money every time they sell it. Is this just a double bluff? Is this like, <laughs> you're saying, no, this, this isn't a real example, but it really is. Is that <laughs> No, I can swear I have never, I've mm -hmm. never worked with Bedford and Strand. I just collect menus and I have a lot of them. <laughs> um, and then I would have a different color for um, the crowd pleasers. So I'm imagining the, uh, the yellow here, the, the steak tartare and the oysters are selling quite well. Um, I'm, um, I'm pretending that the potted terrine of foie gras is a loser. So I'm, I'm highlighting that one um, orange. And then the greens um, are the potentials where uh, possibly they're not selling very much of them, but they could be making money when they do. So once you highlight a whole menu and those losers really stand out and the stars really stand out, it, it just brings the whole project to life. And the, the moment we present those highlighted menus to our clients, they're like, wow, it's like, a real sort of aha kind of moment. Do they, um, do they know that deep down do you think? Possibly um, but it's quite hard to when you're attached to something it's really uh, really yeah, common yeah, that you're that you're sort of attached to a certain dish it's been on the menu for a long time and you think oh this is really popular but in black and white you can sort of see that oh it's actually not selling that much and it's not making me money when I sell it. Um, it's hard to let go of those things. Chefs in particular tend to have certain dishes that they're really attached to and they don't really want to let go. But our advice is usually, so anything we've highlighted orange as a sort of, these are the losers, you should just drop them. Um, that's a hard thing to do, but we do recommend that you do it. And we call it kill your darlings because <laughs> you, you kind of need to let go you're probably going to need space. So particularly if you're trying to improve the user experience on your menu, quite often that means trying to spread things out a bit, play with box outs and um, try to get some breathing space on the menu. Um, you're probably going to need a bit of space to do that. So it is important to lose a bit of dead weight. And we like to remind people that off menu doesn't mean gone forever necessarily. So you can use those off cut dishes to work on the specials board. So you can put them into a bank that can go into rotation. So you've got your specials ready. And, you know, we worked with um, people on this for many years. And a, a few years ago, there was a, a, there was a pub in South London where there was this steak sandwich that the, the chef just said, oh, this is one of the most favorite dishes. And we, we sort of brought out the black and white and said, look, you only sold four of them in the last month. It's just not good enough. And he's like, oh, but there's this one guy who comes in every Friday and he has it. And yeah, sure enough, that was the four times that they sold it that week. It was the guy who'd come in four times and had it. It's almost better to just have off-menu stuff for those kind of regulars. That, and it would probably make him feel more special as well that he can go in and ask for the usual, even though it's not on the menu. So being careful that you're not just sort of creating... Um, dishes for very specific people and you've got to please, please the masses with your with your menu and also locals like specials and they it would mean it would mean that if you push that out on on social media if there's a dish that people have missed they they can look and see oh wow the the mac and cheese is back on again i'm going to go in and it becomes a reason for people to go so don't be afraid to kill your darlings or at least put them into the specials of rotation uh, step seven, this is where all of the studies into persuasion and psychology and conversion techniques really get into play. So 
Um, I'm not going to give away all of our secrets because I've spent the last seven years um, <laughs> accumulating this. And as far as I know, we are the only copywriters who take those sort of tried and tested um, persuasion techniques that people traditionally use to sell SaaS software or, um, you know, other technology things and apply it to menus. So um, I've spent years going to copywriting conferences, learning about these sort of really cool concepts. And I'm thinking, God, how do I use this in restaurants? Yeah. Um, and we've found that menus is the one place where you can try out all this really cool stuff. But um, I'm going to highlight four things that everyone can play around with. And we have a bank of other ones that we can reserve for people who might want to work with us on a menu project going forward. But um, one of the main things is strategic ordering of dishes and what we call the halo effect. So if you go back to that color coded menu, you look at those purple or pink or whatever your favorite color is, those highlights for the real winner dishes, that ones that sell a lot, they make you good money. Um, and also those crowd pleaser dishes that also sell a lot that people seek out on your menu you can order things strategically around those. So yeah. quite often we find that those um, winner dishes are right at the top of a menu. And so obviously they're getting a bit more exposure because it's the first thing everyone sees. So you might end up with a small drop of sales in that particular dish by moving it. But if you notched it down just two steps, the two dishes either side of it will sell a lot more because of the halo effect of that really popular dish. So you can rearrange your menu to make sure that every dish that you're looking to push, so those potential dishes that would make you money, but they're not selling so well, if you make sure that each of those are kind of tied to a best selling dish, um, you're going to sell a lot of them. And there are some really amazing um, results you can receive from them. We've just been testing for one client. We changed the order of their cocktail list and we managed to push up sales of one drink by over 30% by just changing the order in, in which they're listed without actually on that occasion losing sales of any of the other drinks. It's really strange how it works, but we, we are very susceptible to how things are ordered on a menu. So that's, really cool to play around with. Also social proof. So people like recommendations from people and um, we trust things that are best sellers. So there's been loads and loads of research into this that if you even just put the name of your restaurant next to a dish to sort of mark it as a sort of this is a dish that we're really proud of. So instead of calling it the beef burger, you call it, you know, the, the Nando's or they wouldn't have a beef, beef burger, but you, you, add your, you add your name to the burger. So the Nando's burger or you know, the, the Oaxaca burger. You would add that bit of social proof in that we're proud of this one, look for this dish. Also, you can put um, our best selling fajitas. That word best selling in the title of the dish will definitely spike the, the number of sales of that dish because people are looking for those recommendations. You can also play the pricing game and some of the techniques we use are distraction and anchoring. So you don't really want people to go through a menu with cost in mind. So you don't want them to make their selections based on um, what a dish costs. So um, you can kind of distract from the price by hiding it a little bit. So instead of having your list of uh, menu items set left and then a sort of tab with all the prices in one row. If you move the price to be just two spaces away from the description of the dish, so it's up close and sort of in whatever place on the menu that it ends up, um, it's been proven that people stop ordering from a price point of view um, and they instead go for the dishes that they like the sound of. So having like that sort of really straight line of prices means that people look at the prices and decide what to order that way. You can also um, play around with uh, prices that don't really look like prices. There's been loads of studies done in the States where if you remove the dollar sign, um, you can sell more of the more expensive dishes because people disassociate the price with cost because the dollar sign isn't there. So if you go to restaurants in New York, I don't know if you've noticed on trips to the States, 
very um it's very rare now to see any dollar signs on menus it just says sort of you know strip steak forty dollars or like it, it just says forty yeah uh, 32 or whatever and there's no dollar sign and that's been proven time and time again that once people are distracted from associating um the, the price with a the cost they they will order more expensive things i've seen um, it in a few places where they've got um just the actual uh word you know like it's five mm -hmm. like f-i-v-e instead of a like i've seen that in a few sort of more shishi places and again you're almost like buying it because you think it's cute you're kind of like oh that's cute I'll, I'll you know i'll go for that one yeah but, you know, it's interesting to play around because i was always taught i suppose when i was a, a lot younger with menus that you know you want to make the price as clear as possible for people and you know, all that stuff so th this is great knowledge you know to, to, to sort of start playing around with yeah something else you can test is the decimal pricing so um there are people who say that setting a price at 525 is leaving 75p on the table because people associate a price with the big number on the left not with what's after it so if you're going to charge five something you might as well charge 599 or 575 um, people don't actually think of it as much cheaper for being below the 50p mark so you might as well go for your life and, and charge as much as, as you can within that decimal space. Something else you can do with pricing is, um, is anchoring. So anchoring is when you have a dish quite far up on the menu, perhaps even in a prominent box out, that's really expensive. And by anchoring the price in something expensive, everything else around it will look much cheaper by comparison. So you see this done quite successfully on uh, French brasserie menus, for example. They'll have a sort of Chateau Bouillon for two at quite a big, hefty price or a plat de fruit de mer or like some, some kind of big sharing dish. And there's something to do with the psychology of our brains uh, that when we see something really expensive, everything else next to it looks cheaper and, and you start ordering lots of those. Is that like uh, have ugly friends? Yes, <laughs> exactly the same principle, yeah. yeah. And then finally, our particular street, the sweet spot is working the words on the menu. So um, really um, improving those descriptive words that trigger images in people's head and tastes in people's mouths. So um, never using any words that don't mean anything. So going back to what we talked about last week about not using words like delicious because it doesn't mean anything. You should, you should use descriptive words that actually take you closer to um, what it is that you're gonna experience with that dish. And also making sure that you have descriptions. A lot of restaurants will lead quite strongly on sort of funny little ditties or like where this dish came from. And we've done quite a lot of testing um, that shows if you lead on the descriptive food language and then follow up with sort of you know, this is what it was inspired by, or here's where we get our sourcing from. Um, you can sell a lot more because people are ultimately just looking to find out what something's going to taste like, and that's how they make their choices. So just being really clear with your descriptions and the kind of words that you use while you do that. Um, so once we've got all of these insights from the customers, from the team, from the sales um, statistics, um, I love to get my Sharpies out and start sketching. So that's when you can look at how you can take um, a menu from its current design into something that's a bit more user-friendly or how you're going to order things. So like this is an actual picture from two years ago when I was starting to sketch out the Oaxaca project. We were going from this um, menu at the, at the top where it was a little bit disorganized into a much more sort of linear fashion where we were really trying to drive people to order from a certain line of that menu. I'm not a designer, I, I just like Sharpies and <laughs> I like to get things done on the paper. Obviously I then hand this over to a design team that puts it all together, but it can be really useful to just visualize what it is that you have in mind and how it's going to work together. Um, and it's also quite fun to play around, it's, it's almost like having a sort of art project at school, we don't get to do those things anymore. So. 
Well, oh, I, I, just on Mahaka, for example, you know, we go to the Brighton one, you know, not every week or anything, but we go quite often. And um, I noticed the difference of this menu, like without knowing that you'd done it, you know, until we spoke, you know, a wee while ago. Um, it was a marked difference in terms of where your eye was drawn, what you ordered, how much it made you get Oaxaca more. Um, just all of it, you know, so... It, it Amazing. That was exactly what we were looking to do. Fundamental difference to the experience we had. And, you know, like, I, I like Oaxaca, but my wife absolutely loves it, you know. And, and, you know, we were commenting on how clear, how much more clear it was, you know, because we're saddles and talk about restaurant businesses and things like that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I just... I always felt a bit of panic when I used to see a Oaxaca menu and then I used to just order like the same old sort of pill pill thing and go out feeling a bit short changed because I hadn't explored no I hadn't been brave enough or it wasn't understandable enough for me to you know sort of feel like safe safe adventure within it you know but yeah. that definitely made that happen and we've had better experiences for it for sure Awesome. Yeah. Glad to hear it. Thanks for yep. bringing that up. Yeah. Honest, honest feedback. Cool. Um, step eight is keep coming back to that user experience. So in everything that you do, think about, will this make sense to the customers? Am I improving this for the customer? And one of the things that we keep getting asked a lot is what's your thought? Pictures on the menu? No pictures on the menu. Um, Wagamam, I think, have, have done a great job with their new menus of incorporating some images because pictures do sell. Um, a lot of restaurants are reluctant from putting pictures on their menus because I think particularly in this country, it's so closely associated with more lower end restaurants and sort of yeah. chains. So um, a lot of people don't want to do it. So we always try to dig a little bit deeper at every sort of challenge that we come up um, come against and one of the things that we ended up developing for Oaxaca was they didn't want to have pictures on their menu so we suggested having a separate Instagram account so um, it's called Oaxaca menu pics and it's a picture of every single dish on the menu with the um, menu item name on it and we flag that up on the menu so if people don't know what to pick they can go to that Instagram account just look through all of the pictures of the food and then see what it is that they would like to order. So just thinking a little bit creatively about how you can add user experience at every single turn is, is always useful. You've got to be happy with yourself for that, don't you? Yes, and particularly as we've seen it copied at lots of other places. Have you? So that's the, that's the greatest form of flattery. Can we say who's copied it? No, I'm not going to name and shame, but you know, have a little look. <laughs> it's in a few places now, but it works really that, well. Yeah, that's a great idea. Very, very good. Cool. And then step nine of this process is testing. So this is one of the biggest parts of everything we do is we set out some clear hypotheses. So for example, one hypothesis would be I have moved the chicken burger to sit closer to the beef burger that sells a lot more than the veggie burger that used to be in between them. So the hypothesis is by moving this chicken burger one step up, I'm going to sell more of it. So you've got to be really clear on like what it is that you're testing so you can look out for it in the sales figures. Um, we would always allow three months for a big test. So if you're, if you're testing five to ten things on the menu that you've changed you kind of want to run it for a period of time so that you can see how it settles and how those figures change over months also some months are very different to other months so you wouldn't want to be testing something in december and comparing it to november when you have all the christmas party traffic in december which is going to be very different to what it was the month before or if you're testing something in january and you're comparing it to December, which is a much busier month, obviously, than January. So having that three month spread is really good because you can get a more accurate reading on the result. We also will compare against past months and also against uh, the year on year figures. So the same month the, the year before and also the past month the year before so that you can catch any trends that um, have changed. Obviously, you also want to look out for if you're a group of restaurants, if there's been any changes within your group, you can test 
every site against each other if yeah. one of the sites wasn't there the year before then the figures would be all out of whack as well so um ideally you'd want to do um you'd want to select one test site and just run the test menu in that one site for three months because then you can be a little bit bolder about what you test before you apply it to everywhere else so you can choose one test site and run it against whatever site is most similar to that site and you get real-time results comparing the two um, but we find that a lot of people are so excited by their new menu that they want to yeah, just, just push them out across the board so then we would test all the sites that apply um, and, and that sort of note about all the type, sites that apply refers to perhaps there's a site that wasn't there the year before, so we would just take that completely out of the testing so that you're not skewing those results. And then the final test uh, or the final step is just tweak and test again. So when we work with clients on a big menu um, optimization project, we will always teach them how we test so that after they've finished working with us, they can apply that same test technique over and over and over again like um, once you get geeky and into it it's so fascinating to see like it's that sort of power like what can i do how can i how can i change people's behavior just by moving something or tweaking something you get it, it gets really really geeky and um you can quite easily get obsessed with it so i would suggest tweaking something with every menu reprint reprint even if it's like i'm going to change the description of this dish or i'm going to swap these two dishes around or i'm going to box this thing out and see if it sells more when it's got a frame around it tweaking something with every reprint just makes you a it's it's good feedback to see what's happening it's also instant gratification like i've done something that made this amount of impact on the bottom line um and um yeah it's fun so i'm hoping that people will get inspired to want to try a few things tweak a few things and uh, hopefully make some more sales when we open back up again Definitely. so yeah that's all me any questions about menus i love talking about menus i can do it all day so <laughs> hit me up i've got loads of time at the moment if anyone wants to do uh, any kind of guided menu development i'm all ears so my email address is there and uh yeah hopefully we'll get some interest out of this